Hi, my name is Mark, and you're about to watch a message that was preached at Calvary Fellowship in Miramar, Florida. At Calvary, we exist to help people take their next step with God. And today, it is our prayer that this message does just that. How's everybody doing? It's good to see you. It is good to see you. I don't know. I feel like this week is better than last week. Maybe like the second, we're just, we're breaking the place in. Don't break the place, but break the place. Uh, you know we have a Coke machine now. Did you, have you been there? Yes. Jesus said, if you drink of this water, you'll never thirst again. So I'm sure he meant water that was carbonated. But there's some, I, that has been one of my dreams in my life, is to have our own Coke machine. And here we are. Dreams come true. Dreams come true. Set the bar high, friends. Set the bar high. So, all right. We got to begin. Uh, we begin over here because this will make sense. You've been to Calvary. I told this story probably about two years ago. So if you've heard it before, please laugh in the appropriate spots. All right. But uh, uh, how many of you are of some kind of Latin descent? Can I ask that question? Okay. All right. Maybe I should ask who isn't. All right. Uh, so you've heard of something called Cardo Gallego? You've heard of that? Okay. Excellent. Uh, this is, if you're not aware of what this is, and uh, you've been blessed to not have crazy Cuban parents um, in such a way. It's like, hey, I'm a Cuban parent. Oh, well, then you know. So anyway, uh, but Cardo Gallego is a soup. It, it's a traditional Spanish stew. Uh, that is made with collard greens, ham, and salt from the Dead Sea, essentially, because it is the saltiest thing you're ever going to taste. And so the way it would work at my house is that my parents would, would essentially, uh, uh, you know, would torment me with this, is that they would make dinner and then they would put soup. For whatever reason, we had soup almost every night. I do not understand the need for that. It's like if I'm not ill or cold, there's really no need for soup, but whatever. So... Uh, they would make a great meal, and then they would put the cadogoyego in front. Now, um, the, I don't know why I remember such things, but there would be the bowls that we had were like these off-white colored bowls, and then about three-quarters of the way up, they would have this blue uh, little decorative line uh, stripe you know, that would go around it. So my mom would take this stew, and she would fill it up to the blue line. And the rule was I had 30 minutes to drink the soup. If I did not finish drinking the, stu- the soup, she would fill it back up to the line. So I've always felt if you don't like kids, don't have them. But nonetheless, uh, that's what they would do. Well, one day, I don't know what exactly happened, but I to- she poured the soup, and I told her, I'm never drinking this soup again. And she said, Robert, if you don't drink this soup, I'm pouring it over your head. And I said to her, I said, let me save you the trouble. Bam! And I just poured it all over myself. And let me, let me tell you, I felt like a champion of the people that day. <laughs> like, you know, like I had overthrown some kind of dictatorship. But it was a very brief moment. Because I was beaten within an inch of my life <laughs> after that. And, uh, you know, I'm telling you, people, kids now, they don't get it. They're like, oh, you're in timeout. I've said this before. Like, my parents didn't know about timeout. They only knew about knockout. That's it. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, but, you know, I was forced to eat any, you know, like, Whatever was made, you had to eat. You were not allowed to say, I don't like that. Um, like our kids, I tell them, like, you got to try everything. If you don't like it, well, then that's your own problem. But uh, you don't, anyway. So, but I, I was, because I don't know if you had this. My, my mom and my stepdad were always talking about the impending food shortage that was coming to America. You're going to see someday there's not going to be any food. And because we taught you how to eat everything. And I remember thinking, like, what are the chances that there, all the food is going to be wiped out, and all that's going to be left is your nasty stew. <laughs> and that's all, that's all we're going to have. And we're just, like, fighting over the stew. And, um, and, I, and I remember telling them, like, why, why can't we be more positive and think, like, there's going to be no food left except for Happy Meals? That's it, you know? And, man, I would say that. My parents would get so upset. If I would tell my, my folks that I, like, oh, I went out, what would they do? We, like, if my friends had a party, because back in the, like, Late 70s, early 80s, that was big. Like, you'd have your birthday party at McDonald's. And that was so huge. Now, people are like, you know, oh, I don't go to McDonald's. You know, this five McDonald's bags in the back. But it's like, I don't go there. You know, anyway, that's another thing. That's just another sermon. Um, but uh, anyway, so, but they would get so upset because it didn't matter. And once again, if you have Latin parents, you know this, is that if it was not Latin food, it was not real food. What did you eat? I had two bowls of pasta. That's not real food. What did you eat? I ate an entire pizza and a calzone. Not real food. Anyway, so it didn't matter. So, uh, and then they'd be like, why do you like that, that Happy Meal so much? I'm like, listen, you start putting toys in the food, maybe we'll talk, you know. But <laughs> until then, um, that was, I, I just thought that, that was good stuff. And, and here's what happens, right, is that 
Uh, the thing that I think is amazing, it's great marketing, right, is that how, like, I don't, I've never met a kid that wasn't happy eating a happy meal. Why? Because this is built into the name. <laughs> all right. You know, you start eating, you're like, this is all right. Now, now it's not a happy meal after. Then it's like brick because it turns into a brick, you know, uh, and, and it's like sluggish meal, but that's after. But during then, it's still pretty good. Anyway, but you get older, right? But you start out with the happy meal, and then you get a little older, and you're like, hey, I want a happy career, and I want a happy marriage, and uh, I, I want a happy family, and I want a happy life. And you realize, like, that's a little bit more difficult than the happy thing I was looking for when I was a kid. And, and the problem is this, is that sometimes this idea, this, this happy life that we wanted uh, begins to elude us. And, and the, sometimes we start thinking, well, maybe it's because I don't want it bad enough. And that, that's really not it. Or, or maybe it's because I'm not willing to pay the price to be happy. And usually that's not it either because most people that I know, happy or not, really want to be happy. Most are willing to pay the price to be happy. But the challenge is, is that many times we're looking for happiness in the wrong place. And so, listen, we don't find happiness in culture. And sometimes we look, we think we're going to find happiness in culture. Why? Because the definition of happiness is a, of, within culture is always changing. And so what would have made us happy, well, now the definition changed. And now that's not supposed to make us happy. And then we don't find it in stuff. Now, let me just say this. And people say, they're like, you know, you won't be happy if you have stuff. That's not like entirely true. Because if you've ever bought a new car, you ever buy a car with like zero miles? Anybody? Like, everybody, that's a pretty good day. Like, it doesn't even matter what kind of car it is. Like, it's brand new. Like, no one has sat in this seat except me and the man who made it. You know what I mean? That's a good day. The problem is, it's not every day. Because you're, you're happy, like, the first day, and you're happy the second day. You're basically happy until the day you get the first bill. And you're like, what did I do? Was I drunk when I bought this car? You know what I mean? Like, what was I thinking? You're like, no, you bought it at 9 in the morning. What happened? You know, I don't know what happened. It wasn't me. We have your signature it was a twin. I don't know. You know what I mean? But something happens where we thought it was going to be. But so sometimes, but the challenge is this, is that you buy something and it's like, well, it makes you happy the first day, but it's not happiness that lasts for, for any length of time. Why? Because happiness can be, it, it, many times, is a moving target. The Bible challenges us to do something different. It's, it's actually um, a, a, a much higher endeavor. Not to actually seek to be happy, but to instead seek joy. And the difference between happiness and joy, really, it's, they're, they're, they're not totally synonyms as we'd think. Happiness is totally based on my external circumstances, whereas joy is an inside job. I can actually have terrible circumstances and still have joy in my life. Why? Because it's the work that God is doing in me. And then the outside cir circumstances, while, while not ideal, and maybe I might not even be happy, but I can still have joy uh, in, in my life. So we're starting this brand new series of teachings uh, called Greater, as you saw in the open. And what we've been doing is work, we're going to start in this, working our way verse by verse through uh, the book of James. And um, now, if you aren't aware, and you've kind of newer to Calvary, this is kind of what we do for the most part. We go through books of the Bible, and I think in the last 15 years, we've been through, I think, 35 books of the Bible. Um, so, um, and you can't find the, the ones from the first few years because I've destroyed all those, and because they were horrible, uh, really. And you think these are bad, you should have heard those. Um, so, but... Um, now, James, if you're not aware, is, was Jesus' half-brother. Now, uh, if you're familiar with the Christmas story at all, you know uh, Mary uh, was found to be with child before she was married to Joseph. Obviously, God was, her fa was uh, Jesus' father, and so and Mary, his mother. But then, later on, after they were married, Mary and Joseph, they had several children, according to the New Testament, James being one of them. And so, uh, now, if we can all take a moment and just acknowledge that it would be difficult being uh, the brother of Jesus. Like, I think that would be a tough thing, right? Not, not saying we wouldn't want to have him as a brother. I'm just saying it would be a, it's a tough, especially him being the eldest brother, because that's what he was. Um, because, you know, if you're a parent, you kind of, like, gauge everything based on, like, you know, hey, we t we, this has all been tested on the first one, you know? Um, that's why the, there's that old saying that, you know, every parent owes their oldest child an apology, um, <laughs> which is basically it. But, there you go, well. Write that letter. So uh, anyway, but really it's true because you're just testing stuff out. No, don't do that. Go ahead and do that. You know what I mean? It's like we're just figuring it out. So uh, what happens is, is that, but you can imagine being, Jesus being the eldest brother. Then you have these other kids. They're like, wow, the first one was great. You know, 
these kids are a mess. You know what I mean? And then James, I can only imagine, he, you know, you can imagine that conversation. James, why can't you clean up, keep your room clean? Why is it that we always have to tell you, um, you know, to take a bath? Why is it that we're always telling you to clean your room and uh, pick up the dishes? Well, why, you know, we didn't have to do this with Jesus. And we go, oh, Jesus is so perfect. <laughs> yeah. It kind of is. You're a disaster, you know? And uh, so... But it, it, it happens, right? And, uh, but I think it would be tough. Now, to a much lesser degree, um, I have an older brother. And uh, my older brother, he's five years older than me. He's, mu- he's not as good looking as I am. But um, so I, he listens to these messages once in a while. So I like to say things that are subliminal. Like that. That was subliminal. Anyway, no. But um, my older brother, my, my brother, my older brother's the one who shared the gospel with me. He became a Christian about three or four years before I did. And uh, my older brother, he, he lives in Boston. He's lived in Boston his whole life. And so he, uh, he went to this conference uh, in New Hampshire. And while he was there, this guy walks up to him and says, uh, he sees his name tag, and he goes, Billy Frank was. And the guy says, hey, uh, would you happen to be related to Bob Frank was the author? And the, my brother's like, yes, uh, I am. He's my younger brother. And, he's, and, and then the guy starts going on and on about how much he loves my books, how he subscribes to, this, to our podcast, listens to my messages every week, how much I've blessed his life. And it was just more than my brother could handle. <laughs> and, and he calls me, and, uh, and so he calls me, uh, this is right after, and he goes, hey, I met one of your fans today. And, uh, and I'm like, you did? <laughs> I only have one. Uh, and so, so how is he? And anyway, so no, but I... I start, he starts telling me, he goes, listen, the guy's telling me, or you, you know, he tells me the story that I just relate to you, and he goes, listen, I was able to put up with it for like 30 seconds, and then I'm like, listen to me, I grew up with him, he's not that awesome, okay, <laughs> and I don't know how you feel about that, that I said that to him, and I just told him, I said, listen, I was, haters gonna hate, that's all, you know, <laughs> hashtag haters, so anyway, um, so to a much lesser degree, once again, it's difficult, you know, I mean, could you imagine that, you know, Jesus being your older brother. And so the brothers of Jesus didn't believe in him until after the resurrection. And so uh, according to 1 Corinthians, after the resurrection, um, 1 Corinthians 15, um, Jesus appeared to James, and then his brothers became, uh, all of his younger brothers became believers. And in fact, James became uh, not only a leader in the early church, but one of the most ardent followers of Jesus until he was later uh, martyred for his faith. And uh, he was called James the Just. Uh, now, typically, there would be kind of some kind of nickname, um, and so, you know, with most people, because people didn't really necessarily go by first and last name, um, or be, you know, so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, but then, but they, he was called James the Just because of his character, because of his integrity, and so when he wrote the book of James, uh, it was essentially a call for greater character, greater integrity, to essentially live your life, walk with God, but live it to a greater degree, and so he's going to open the book. By giving us the tools that we need to have greater joy in our lives. And the thing that I find interesting is that the three places that he chooses to say, hey, if you want greater joy, here's, a, here's the place to find him. And here's the amazing thing that happens. Those would be the three places that we would look and say, this, these are the things that are causing the biggest amount of frustration in my life. If we would, if we would look at these, these three areas, right? And, and what James does, he says, listen, if you take these three areas and just kind of look at them from a different perspective, you would actually find joy in them because you would see what God is doing in your life through this situation. So listen, if you're here and you are struggling, then uh, you're, in, you're in a good spot uh, because this message is for you. And if you're here and you're saying, man, I'm not really sure what to do when it comes to the future, then listen, take notes because this message is for you. And if you're, um, you're in a place in, in your life where you know, you've come up empty, you're looking for answers, or whatnot, then, then listen, James is going to speak to you in your situation. So let's start uh, the book of James, starting verse 1. Real simple, says this. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. Now if you pause there and give me your attention, I want to just talk the first verse for a moment, um, because the first thing that James would teach us, number one, if you're a note taker, and that is that joy comes in understanding ourselves. It comes in understanding ourselves. As I mentioned, James was a leader in the early church, and he could have opened this letter by writing, James the Just. Whoa, okay, now we know who we're dealing with. He could have started, James, brother of Jesus, 
You know what that means. Listen up. I mean, he really could have come on strong, but instead what he does is he uses this phrase called bondservant. It says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus. Now, this term bondservant, the Greek word is the word doulos, D-O-U-L-O-S, if you're a note taker, and it refers to not just anyone who was a servant, but it was a special kind of servant. Um, let me read you the passage where it comes from in the book of Exodus. It says this. It says, when you buy a Hebrew slave, he will serve six years. Uh, in the seventh year, he goes free for nothing. And if he came in single, he leaves single. If he came in married, he leaves with his wife. Um, if the master gives him a wife and he should, uh, give him, have, he should have sons and daughters, the master, uh, the, the wife and the children will stay with the master and he leaves by himself. But suppose the slave should say, I love my master, my wife, and my children. I don't want my freedom. Then the master is to bring him before God to a door or doorpost and pierce his ear with an awl as a sign that he is a slave for life. So let me explain to you how it works, okay? So guy owes someone else a whole bunch of money. Now, in that culture, there was no such thing as bankruptcy. So what you had to do was go to the person that you owed all the money to and say, listen, I don't have money to pay you back. But what I will do is work for you to work it off. And so essentially, that's the kind of slavery that uh, was being talked about is that basically you would go to work for the person you owed the money for. It was for six years. In the seventh year, you'd go free. And so you would do that so that you could work off the debt. But then you would leave debt free um, after, after that, that season of time. But what would happen is, is that sometimes the master would take a liking to the person who was working for him for those six years. And, uh, you know, maybe he would give him a girl's telephone number. Hey, you should call this girl. You know, she, she works here too, or, or however things worked at that time. And, um, you know, they would, maybe this guy would meet a girl, they would get married, and then they would have children, and then it was time for him to leave. And he's like, hey, you know, I, I don't think I really want to go. Because, and the guy who owed the money, who now is debt free that could leave, said, well, you know, the reality is, is that life here is pretty good. And you treat me really good, and things are a lot better here than they were beforehand. And so then what they would do is they would go to the gate of the city, which is essentially city hall at that time. They would meet with the elders of the city, the leaders. And then they would, uh, the, the elders of the city would uh, interview the man to make sure that he wasn't being coerced. And then, if everything was okay, then uh, they would go to a doorpost and they would essentially pierce his ear. And so, and then the man would be a servant, but he wouldn't just be a servant. He would be a bond servant. And that is that he was not a servant because he had to. He was a servant because he wanted to. And that's the difference, and that is the word that James uses to describe himself. That he is not a servant because he has to. He is a servant because he wants to. And listen, we live in a world where titles mean everything. And the way that people attain status is, you know, the level of entourage that you, you carry with you. And in the kingdom of God, what, what Jesus does is that he turns it on its head. And he says, hey, if you want to be great, it's not how many people are serving you. Instead, if you want to be, if you want to be great, it's about how many people you serve. Jesus would say it this way in Matthew chapter 20. It says, Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their... High officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so James opens and he says, hey, I'm a bond servant. My, my whole existence is I serve because I'm willing. Jesus, he learned that from, from his older brother, that if he wants to be great, that the key to it is to be a bond servant, and that that's who we are called to be. People who not just not, we don't serve because we have to. We serve because we want to. And so many times what happens is, is that we struggle because like, oh, well, I want the next promotion. I want the next thing. I want the next thing that can be my status symbol to show how I'm doing in life. And what happens is, is that we, we come into the kingdom, we come into, you know, um, we come to know Jesus, and Jesus turns that on, on its head, and he's like, no, it's not about how many people serve you, it's not about how many status symbol things that you have, people let, so you can, people know where you are in life, instead, it's something else, instead, it's about you serving other people, and that there's a joy in that, when I first started serving, I had first become a Christian, maybe a Christian for a year, and I, I, at the church I was going to, I said, hey, I wanted to start um, 
serving, and I thought, because I'd been a musician, that they would, you know, have me lead worship, or because I'd read some books at the time, I'd read like four, and I thought, well, hey, you know, can I, can I maybe do some, do some teaching? And uh, I'm like, maybe I could teach like a new believers class. They're like, oh, you like new believers? I'm like, yeah, I, I, I love working with, you know, helping out new believers, because I used to, you know, was one like four weeks ago. And uh, I'm like, okay, great. Um, we, we actually need some help in our new believers ministry. I'm like, oh, that's great. Um, and they say, well, we need you to show up at 6.30 in the morning on Sunday. And uh, so I did. And, and I'm like, oh, so where am I teaching? No, 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 teaching. Uh, we need you to set up all the chairs for the person who's teaching. So the person who comes in and teach doesn't have to worry about that, but you can just set up all the chairs. I'm like, oh, okay. And then, um, and then we need you to make all the coffee because people in the morning, you know, they like to drink coffee. And so I, there's like a hundred, like to this day, I really only know how to make coffee for a hundred people or more. Because we had one of those old big, you know, things, um, those big, you know, like uh, aluminum uh, containers. And so then you would basically you'd open up the giant can of coffee. You'd put dump the whole thing in and then you would put in two gallons of water and just plug the thing in and you walked away. So like over the years, I've been married now, uh, I've, you know, it'll be uh, more than it's almost 19 years that I've been married. And my wife will say, hey, can you make coffee? And I'm like, do you have two gallons of water? And uh, I don't know how to make coffee for two people. I do know how to make coffee for 200. And uh, so it's like, oh, forget it. Anyway, so that's how you get out of doing things, by the way. Um, so nonetheless, but what they did was uh, they, I just, they just gave me a menial job. And like, hey, just here, this is where everybody starts. And if you really want to serve, you'll, you'll do that. And so the, I had to set up chairs. I learned how to make coffee. Um, I, 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 you know, they, they had me cut bagels. And I'm like, don't no, people normally know how to do that? Yeah, but what if someone only wants a half? No, I'm just, I'll just cut it for them. I'm like, okay, then I cut all the bagels, and then there's fruit, so I'd like cut up the fruit, and then they'd give me this giant block of cheese, and then these people would all say, hey, look, Bob's cutting the cheese. And it uh, <laughs> just shows you these people were not godly at all. They, they, they needed a lot of prayer. And so, but the point was this. What they were looking for is to see if I would be faithful. And, and you know, the Bible says that if you're faithful in li with little, God will make you ruler over much. And so what they were looking at is, hey, you know what, we, you might have some ability, but we want to see if you'll be faithful with little. And if you're faithful with little, then we'll see what happens um, in, in, in the future. And so, but what sets it on its head is that sometimes what, what causes us to not have joy is the fact that we're, we're trying to have the status that everybody else does. Maybe you've noticed this on your street like I notice it on my street. And that is when one person on my street buys a car, there's this illness that everybody gets. And it's like, Half the block, everybody starts getting a new car. Why? And it's not because everybody's, you know, warranty is expiring at the same time. It's because there's this thing that I'm saying, hey, he got a new car. Huh. I know what he does for a living. I don't know why he would need a new car. This car's such a hunk of junk. I've had it for two and a half years. You know what I mean? And then, why? Because there's this whole, now it becomes a whole thing about status. And if we will understand ourselves and just say, you know what? It's not about that. What gives me joy is not about people serving me. What gives me joy is serving others. Listen, we will, act, we will find joy and we will bypass all of the things that actually will cause, that cause us frustration. We'll actually find a whole lot of joy. He goes on and he says, listen, if you want to find joy, understand yourself that we're servants. We serve willingly. Why? Because God has done so much for us. We want to do something for him. He goes on in verse 2. If you have your Bible, look what it says. My brethren, count it all joy. When you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now, second thing, um, if you want to have greater joy, and that is joy comes, from, joy comes when you learn to handle problems. Joy comes when you learn to handle problems. James is not, not saying, and notice he doesn't say when you learn how to completely avoid problems. It's like, it, it, you think like joy would come, like I have no problems in my life ever. Wow, you must have so much joy. It is, it's wonderful. Uh, but that's not what he's saying. James is saying, and he, by the way, he's not saying that we should cheer whenever a problem comes into our life. Like, man, that just happened. Yes. You know, that's not what he's saying. What he is saying is that there's things that trials and difficulties produce in our lives that, are, that is something worth cheering about. Now, I'm sorry I have to be the one to tell you this, but... Most of the growth, if you look back, right, if you look back, most of the growth that's happened in your life and my life has happened during challenging seasons that have come into our lives. You ever notice that? 
that that's like the greatest time of growth, of when God was doing a work, we trusted him, and then it's like, man, we came out and we were stronger, we were, had more faith, more trust, more belief in what God was going to do. It was always during a difficult season. Have you ever noticed that that's not, I, I wish I could tell you, you know what's going to cause you to have more faith in your life and trust God more? Longer vacations. That's what's going to do it. That's what you need to do. You need to lay on a beach in some other country some, somewhere and that you're going to come back filled with faith and knowing. Right, I wish it's true, but it's not. It's not the, it's not the way that, that it works, right? It, it's like lifting weights. Muscles grow when they're subjected to stress. Like, you ever, I, like one of the things that I wish, I wish I could get ripped watching other people work out. <laughs> to me, that would be one of the greatest of all gifts that we could receive, Right? Like, and I just have this dream because I do enjoy watching other people work out. There are entire shows built around that. You ever watch the CrossFit games? That is a television show so for you to sit on your couch and watch someone else work out. You ever, you ever seen those, like, ESPN years ago used to do, like, those strongman competitions where these one, this one guy would, like, lift a Kia? You know what I mean? And it's like, you do all this crazy stuff. That is a television show for people to sit to watch somebody else work out. I mean, it's, uh, and I just think it would be amazing for me to sit on my couch with a, pole, with a pizza on one side <laughs> and a box of donuts in the other and just watch. <sighs> That's a Slurpee, by the way. And, uh, and I just rock in that. And then as I'm, as I'm having my donuts and pizza, maybe even simultaneously, as, and then as I'm doing that, you know what's happening? As I'm watching that, I'm just like. <laughs> and I'm just getting ripped as I'm watching it. <laughs> Wouldn't that be? And then I'm walking in the mall. <laughs> this is my ripped look. Because <laughs> underneath all this, I am ripped. Uh, so anyway, so you're wa you, I'm watching. And then someone walks up to me like, I I'm sorry, can I ask you a quick question? Do you watch, watch a lot of weightlifting shows? <laughs> Why, yes, I do. You know, and then, and that's what would happen. And then all the people that watch the cooking channel would get fat. <laughs> like, yeah, watching too much Chopped, are we? Yeah. <laughs> Lay off Emerald, man. Lay off. You seen Emerald lately? He's, he's eating what he's cooking. Anyway, so... No, but I've been trying to eat healthy. I really have. I've been trying to, I, I've been trying to eat healthy, lose some weight. I'm doing 100 crunches a day. I'm for real. They're Nestle's crunches, but still. <laughs> it's a start is what I'm saying. It's a start. So, but here's the point, right, is that he says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials because the testing, he says, knowing that the testing of our faith produces patience. You see, he says knowing. That word knowing, you want to circle that if you have your Bible, and it's the Greek word gnosko. It's where we get our, um, and, and uh, this, this word gnosko, uh, it means this. It means experiential knowledge. It's not, uh, oh, I know this because I read, it out of, I read it in a book somewhere. I don't know it because someone told me. He says, it, it is, gnosko is experiential knowledge. I have experienced it, and therefore I know it to be true. And so listen, these trials that we go in, just like stress, uh, uh, you know, stressing out the muscle makes it grow. The trials that we go into produce a godly result and transform us into the people that God is seeking to create us to be. I mean, think about the challenges that you've experienced in your life. And listen, many of them are, are really difficult things. If you've gone through the loss of a parent and you walked through that and you say, man, that was one of the most difficult times in my life. Um, and man, that was just that's, that was the challenge. And you know what? You come out the other side and you say, man, but God showed me something. I learned something about who God is in, in, that, in that season. You know, maybe you had a relationship end. And the relationship ended and you were like, man, how did this whole thing fall apart? And yet you learned some lessons. And then you took that into the next relationship that you got into. And now you look back and you say, man, it's not that I would want to go through that again. But I learned something in the process that now is going to serve me for the rest of my life. And so whether it's something, you know, man, you had to go through a bankruptcy, I'm going through a difficult season with, with my kids and a season of rebellion or something like that. And, and what happens is, is that you learn some lessons that would have been impossible to learn any other way. And so if you're being tested, the thing that James says, not that the test is great, but what it produces is something that only the test can produce. And it's something that you wouldn't have been able to learn any other way. And see, the thing that's amazing to me 
is that God has this way when he tests us, because it's always pass or fail, right? And that if, if, we're, if we fail the test, God has this way, uh, and maybe you've noticed this, of giving you the test again. You ever notice that? Man, I failed that test. Oh, good, here it comes again. And then, it's like, and you ever find, like, hey, I feel like I'm on the hamster wheel. You know, it's like, I keep going. I, it's like I'm in Groundhog Day. I keep living the same thing over and over. Here's what I always think about if I'm ever in there. I'm like, have I failed the test somewhere? And, like, God just keeps giving me the same test again, right? Like, man, like, like I, I am not a patient man, I, and I know that. It's one of my, um, it's one of my downfalls. And I, and I would learn to be patient, so unfortunately I don't have time. But... Um, <laughs> But what happens is this, is that when I notice when I'm being like extra impatient, um, like everything starts to take longer. The most basic things take longer. You know, it's like I'm driving home and now there's some kind of car crisis. And it's not really a crisis. It's some person changing a tire. And, uh, and, and, I, and then I realize, like, I, mean, I can't believe this. And then I realize this was all for me. This is all God is using this. All these people. He's been orchestrating all of this just for me. And so, by the way, if you're ever in that, there's somebody in the back. It's for them. It's not even for you. It's for them. You're like, I guy, learn the lesson, buddy. You know, that's what you want to tell them. Like, because I got to get home. That's why. And so, but the, the thing is this, because the testing, right, we pass the test, it causes us to be complete. And then the cool thing is when we pass the test, it, it shows God, shows us, hey, we're ready for greater things. Well, look at what happens. What happens if you're in a difficult season, you don't know what to do? Look at what James says next. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. And let not that man suppose that he'll receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. Here's the third thing, and that, that is that joy comes when wisdom is attained. Joy comes when wisdom is attained. We all have to decide where to go when we're confused or need help. We all have to decide where we're going to go. And we, we have, and the, and the amazing thing is, is that in the culture in which we live, there are a million places that we could go that are offering help, right? It could be as, um, as, as you know, binary as I'm opening up the newspaper because I want to check the horoscope because the decision that I make, I need to know where Venus and Mars are. So I can, I can make that choice. Um, or, you know, you can call psychics and all that. You know, you call Miss Cleo. Um, you guys remember Miss Cleo? Anybody? Yeah. You know, and uh, you know Miss Cleo got sued. She did. She never saw it coming. So weird. <laughs> so, and it, that was wrong. That was wrong. I shouldn't have said that. Hilarious, but wrong. Anyway, so, <laughs> I love that joke. I've told it many times. Uh, so, <laughs> so listen, Colossians says this, as far as a place to go, this is the best place to go. He says this, my goal is that they may be encouraged in heart, united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding, in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You see, God wants to give you wisdom if you ask him. I love verse 5. And he, when he say, it says, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. But it's, it doesn't stop there. He says, let him ask of God who gives liberally and without reproach, which means without finding fault. It's not that you're going to ask God. And he's like, I can't believe you're asking something so basic. No, instead, he's, he's there waiting, saying, okay, I'm, I'm, if, you, if you want to know, I'm here to tell you. I'm, I'm readily available to tell you. You see, when uh, King Solomon um, was... When he became king, God uh, appears to him, and he says, what do you want? Because your, your father David followed me, I'm going to give you this, this request. And he basically just says, here's a blank check. You fill in the amount. And Solomon says, here's what I want. I want wisdom to lead your people. And God is so moved by that. Listen to what it says in your notes. It says, the Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for wisdom. And so God replied, because you have asked for wisdom in governing my people with justice and have not asked for a long life or wealth or the death of your enemies, I will give you what you've asked for, and I will give you a wise and understanding heart, such as no one has ever had or ever will. And I will also give you what you did not ask for, riches and fame. No other king in all the world will compare to you for the rest of your life. And if you follow me and obey my decrees, 
and my commands, as your father David did, I will give you a long life. You see, that's how valuable wisdom is. And it's available to you and me for the asking. It's available to us when we open God's word and say, God, I want you to speak to me. And he's faithful to speak to us. But listen, the best part is, is that when God comes, you know, when, when we're in a situation, we can come to God. And what we find is, is that he, it's a joy for him to give us wisdom so we know the right choice to make. Because when he knows that our heart is to obey him, and we say, God, I just, I want to know the right thing to do. It's not that God's purposely withholding it. It's that he's ready to give it. You see, I've learned this as a dad. Uh, I, have, I have three kids. And one of the things that I've learned is that um, at all of them around the same age, around age three, uh, they all learned, uh, you know, they all started talking. I don't know why this is, but as a parent, um, you're, you're, as, when your kids are born, like you can't wait for them to start talking. And then they start talking and then you're trying to figure out for they, them to stop talking. And um, so what happens is this, is that my, my kids all around the same time, they were never coached, they never had a meeting together, but they all learned this phrase, all by myself. And that became like their, their, their cry of independence. Hey, do you want some help with that? No, all by myself. Hey, can I, can I help you with that? No, all by myself. And whatever it was, it was this thing. And, and what happened was is that as a dad, because I knew that what they were doing was a little more complex than what they were able um, to, to, to comprehend, I would stand there waiting. Because I knew at some point they would ask and say, Dad, can you help me? And I want you to know that it wasn't at that moment that I was like, come on, figure it out. No, no, no. It was, once again, as a loving dad, I was more than happy to help. And certainly... Our Heavenly Father is standing by in the same way when we're trying to take on a challenge, a difficulty, and if we're lacking wisdom, it's not that he's holding out. Instead, he is ready to give it because he loves you. And sometimes we say, man, I wish God would tell me. I, I want to know. And could it be that God's just waiting for you to ask? That he, it says that if any man lacks wisdom, that we can ask God and he will give it liberally without finding fault and it will be given to him. And so whatever the area in our lives that we say, man, I really do need wisdom, right? If you're a parent, then you already know that, that we need wisdom. Because these kids did not come with an instruction manual. Instead, we just go to God and say, God, you know, I want to train up this child in the way he should go. How do I do that? How do I do that in, in 2015 and, and, and make that make sense of all that? And, and you know what? If we ask him, he will give us wisdom. You know, whether it's that or whether you're, maybe you're, you're a newly married couple and you're thinking, man, marriage is a little harder than I thought it would be. I, I'm not sure how we navigate this. The good thing is that we have a God that if we lack wisdom, he will give it to us if we ask him. Single adults, and you say, man, finding somebody was a little harder. It's harder than it looks on TV. And uh, it is. But, you know, we can ask God. He can give us wisdom so that we know the right choice to make. And, and the thing is this, is that we, we, whatever area of life, if we really will go to him and ask him, he really will give us wisdom liberally and without finding fault. But see, the first place is not in just saying, well, God, this is what, this is what I need. But instead, the first place is saying um, that you want him to be your heavenly father. Because, and I've shared this in the past, that a lot of times you say, well, you know, we're all God's children. Well, to, if we're really technically we're all God's creation we become God's children when we decide to call him father he's willing he's desiring but we have to decide whether we want him to be our heavenly father or not and see whenever we get to the place where we say man but but man where was God man I was hurt and this happened and this happened where was he he was there and I can tell you this, that God will never waste a hurt in your life. Instead, all of those things, all those experiences have, have been used. And now what's going to happen is that God wants to take those things. He wants to bring joy into your life and take you to a higher level than you thought possible. And so for some of us, we've made excuses. And we've said, this is the reason that I'm not following God or whatever. But the reality is, is that we're just running from Him. And maybe today is the day to stop running. Maybe today is the day to just say, yeah, you know, I, I really want to walk with him. I, I really want to know him. I want to call him Father so that when I ask for wisdom from him, 
I'm willing to receive it. And um, that first decision is the wisest decision a person could ever make. And when you make that choice, it begins that domino effect of all the other things beginning to fall into place so that your life really can be greater than you thought possible. And it begins at the place of saying, God, I need you. And him saying, I'm here and I've been here the whole time. Let's pray together. And God, we want to thank you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for working in us. And we look forward, God, to the work that you want to do that we can just call out to you if we lack wisdom and that you're there ready, willing, and able to do an amazing work in us and through us. And Lord, I just pray now for those of us who are going to call on you, that you would hear from heaven and that you would answer and that things would never be the same as we call on you. Listen, with every head bowed and every eye closed as we're praying together, maybe as we talked about calling God your heavenly father, maybe that strung a cord, struck a chord and maybe you're in the place now where you're saying, you know what, I need to call on God. I need wisdom. I need God to forgive me because I've kind of done my own thing. Listen, with every head bowed, with every eye closed, as we're praying together, if you say, that's me, Pastor, I need you to pray for me, I'm going to invite you to just lift a hand. So you, um, yeah, I see hands all over this room. God bless you guys. God bless you guys. Lord, I want to thank you so much for every hand that's lifted that represents a heart that is open. And I pray, Lord, that as they call out to you, that you would hear, that you would answer and act, and that they would leave this place different the way that they came in because they would know that you are with them no matter what. Listen, if you lifted a hand, I'm going to invite you to repeat this prayer with me. It's not a magic formula, but it's maybe my words, but I pray that it expresses your heart to God in this moment. We're going to all pray it together. I'm just going to invite you to repeat after. Just say, Lord God, I open my heart. I invite you inside to be my God, to be my Savior, to be my friend. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me clean. For I've decided today to follow Jesus. From this day, I'm yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yeah. We hope you enjoyed the message. If today you want to take your next step with God and give your life to Jesus, we have a free gift for you. All you got to do is go to mycalvary.com forward slash begin. I also want to encourage you, share this message with your friends and your family, and also follow us on Facebook and Instagram. From all of us at Calvary, God bless you.